Today on Basic Bytes, we are taking a brief look at the new version 3.6 of the Vice Commodore 64 emulator, which within my first hour or so of using it, has already shown itself to have several new features and new bugs. Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes, and today we are looking at the new Vice version 3.6. Vice is, of course, the versatile Commodore emulator, and as many of you already know, it is the go to emulator for Commodore 64 enthusiasts in 2021. However, its versatility comes in the fact that it can also emulate an entire host of other Commodore 8 bit machines. In this video, we will just be focusing on the Commodore 64. However, I recently did another video on the Vice Commodore 128 emulator and specifically how to get the 80 column screen working, which can be a bit of a trick. So if you are interested in knowing the trick, please check out that other video after this one. In the meantime, let's take a look at what's new. I hope everyone had a very Merry Christmas. I myself was largely offline for a couple of days and came back to discover that version 3.6 of Vice had in fact been released on Christmas Eve, which is pretty much exactly a year after the previous version 3.5. Alongside it is detailed documentation about what is new in the latest release with the comment, this is definitely worth reading. I would encourage you to read that on your own as this video is not a deep dive, but rather a short look at a few enhancements as well as bugs that I've already discovered within my first hour or so of using the new version. The first question, of course, is what version to download? And here we see we basically have two options, GTK3 or SDL2. Of course, there is both 64 and 32-bit, but that decision should be pretty obvious, and you would need a rather old version of Windows to want the 32-bit version. For users of the iFruit in its various incarnations, we see that the GTK3 version is the one that is recommended, and I would personally suggest that GTK3 be regarded as the recommended version for Windows users as well. GTK is what the previous version 3.5 was based on, and will have a very familiar interface if that's the version that you've been using. The SDL2 version, which I also downloaded, is a rather different experience, and we're going to take a quick look at that one first. Regardless of which version you download, you simply extract the archive into a folder of your choice and run the program. This is the SDL version of the new Vice 3.6. If you use the previous Windows version, the first thing that is immediately apparent is the complete lack of any menu or status bar on the interface. Instead, what we get is a helpful press F12 for the menu on the title bar. Pressing F12 to engage the menu, we find that all of our familiar vice settings have now been built into an interface that exists within the screen of the Commodore 64 emulator itself. This menu can be very easily navigated using the up and down arrow keys to select an item on the current screen, as well as the right and left arrow keys to move into and out of the submenus, as well as out of the main menu itself. While this integrated menu system is indeed interesting and arguably does present the user with a more immersive 8-bit look and feel, I nonetheless find it to be quite a bit clunkier in configuring the emulator than the proper Windows dialog boxes presented by the GTK version of this software. I have also noted that while the SDL version does look quite good at its default size, the CRT emulation in this software very readily begins to develop aberrations as one resizes this window from its default size. 
My review of the SDL version is, therefore, that this is the version you would probably want if you were running the emulator as an embedded solution in a system where it was meant to run and remain full screen, thus necessitating that all of the menu options be contained within the Commodore 64 itself, so to speak. For the average desktop user running the emulator in windowed mode, stick with the GTK version, which is coming up next. Returning to more familiar territory, this is the GTK version of Vice 3.6, and it has both the menu bar and the status bar that we have come to expect. At first look, it's clear that the status bar has been polished up somewhat with various controls that used to be aligned over to the right-hand side now all being stacked towards the left. The height of the status bar has increased slightly with added controls and indicators for the warp mode, which accelerates your CPU and comes in quite handy on calculation-heavy applications, or if you are loading something at stock 1541 drive speeds. As well, there is the pause button, which is a modern-day freeze button for the C64 emulator, if you will. Another small change that I particularly like is that the frames per second counter is now displaying to the nearest tenth of a frame rather than to the thousandth. In previous versions, having three digits after the decimal place resulted in a constantly fluctuating number that served as more of an annoyance rather than providing any actual useful information. There is one new quirk that has been introduced with the status bar redesign, and it is by far the less important of the two bugs that I will be showing in this video, but simply observe the two drive light LEDs as I reset the emulator. Notice that device 8 was green, but device 9 was red. Well, when I loaded this emulator, I did a settings reset to clean out any old garbage that may have been in there from a previous version, and set up a two-drive system, as is my preference. And upon seeing device 9 light up red on startup, I thought, oh, well, I must simply have accidentally selected device 9 as being a standard 1541, rather than the 1541 Mark II that I actually meant to select. Going into the Preferences and looking at the Drive Settings, we see that Device 9 is, in fact, a 1541 Mark II. And interestingly, there seems to be an introduced bug wherein Device 9 will always display the red LED even if it doesn't correspond to the LED color of the drive unit. For example, even the 1571 shows an incorrect red LED color. Looking at device 8, if we select the original 1541, we get the correct LED color, and if we select the 1541 Mark II, we get the correct LED color again. Once again, this is not a bug that in any way reduces usability of the software. Uh, it just seems to be a weird quirk that nonetheless gives the wrong visual feedback in terms of what drive type has actually been selected for each device. Back onto the positive side of things, my favorite feature of 3.6 so far is just how clean and sharp the CRT emulation looks in this version. And of course, that is an integral part of giving the user an authentic 1980s look and feel. Upon loading this version, I experimented with resizing the window to all various sizes, and I could not, in fact, find a size at which the CRT emulation did not look quite smooth and quite good. This is a remarkable improvement over previous versions, wherein resizing your window would cause the CRT emulation at various sizes to generate these 
horizontal wavy aberrations and one would have to continue to tweak the size of the window in order to smooth things out again. The reason for this improvement can be seen in settings. In host display, there is now a new bicubic GTK render filter which did not exist in previous versions and it is set to be the default. In previous versions, the best available option was bilinear, and if I select that here, you can already start to see some of the horizontal distortion that I mentioned creeping in, even at the current display size, whereas when I go back to bicubic, everything smooths itself out quite nicely. Bicubic scaling is slightly more CPU intensive than bilinear, however, in terms of a modern processor, the impact should be minimal. Unfortunately, I wasn't using 3.6 for very long when I discovered a newly introduced bug that rather messes with my own personal workflow, and that is that 3.6 no longer seems to be able to correctly detect when a keyboard key is being held down upon reset. This can be rather important as various well-known utility and fast loader cartridges detect what mode the user wishes to put them in by detecting that a key is being held down when the user resets the machine. Arguably, the most prominent among these, and the one that I use the overwhelming majority of the time on both my actual hardware and in Vice Emulator, is, <laughs> of course, the Final Cartridge 3. Don't program without it. And this is TFC3 loaded up in Vice 3.5 so that I can show you how it's supposed to work. The final cartridge 3 starts up in desktop mode by default, but goes straight to basic if you are holding down the run stop key on reset or startup. So I will hold down the escape key, which is mapped to run stop, and I will press alt F9 simultaneously, which is the key combination for a soft reset. And of course we're straight into basic and we can proceed from here. And now for contrast in version 3.6, holding down the escape key, aka run stop, and performing a soft reset. And we are straight back to the default desktop and you can do this all day and you will never get it to detect that you are holding down the key, as such you cannot quickly kick it into basic. The other prominent cartridge that is affected by this bug is the better working turbo load and save, which I realize is not on everyone's radar, but here in my part of Canada, back in the day, I encountered it in the wild just as frequently, if not more so, than the Epic's fast load. Here we are once again in Vice version 3.5, and you are looking at the Turbo Load and Save's default startup screen, which has nothing other than the fast load and save routines enabled. However, if you hold down the Commodore key, as is mapped to Tab, and you do an Alt F9 soft reset, lo and behold, we are now in basic version 4 with the expanded command set available to us as well. Moving back to version 3.6 now, this is another case where you can hold down the Commodore key and do a soft reset until the cows come home, and the cartridge will never be able to detect that the key is being held down to switch it into the other mode. Although there may not be a good workaround for this bug with every cartridge, there are workarounds for the two that I have just shown. If you go to the final cartridge page on Replay Resources and you scroll down to where the binaries are available for download, you'll notice that there is one binary version labeled 1988-13. This is in fact the same as 1988-12, which is the last and final official ROM version for the final cartridge 3, but it has a one-byte hack 
which reverses the behavior of the reset routine so that it starts up in basic by default rather than in the desktop by default. And this will be the version that I use with version 3.6 Similarly, for the better working turbo load end save, the cartridge speeder page on the same website has this archive of cartridge speeder all, and it not only contains the default version, but there is also a cartridge labeled turbo load and save enabled, which similarly inverts the reset routine so that the cartridge starts up in basic version 4 rather than version 2 by default. So there it is, my first look at Vice 3.6. I'm sure there's plenty more to be discovered, although I will be keeping 3.5 on my hard drive alongside it while I do so. In any case, Vice remains an excellent piece of free software that now looks better than ever. It would simply be fantastic if the Vice team released an official 3.6.1 in the near future to put some final polish on this version and stamp out some of the little bugs that have crept in with the new release. If you found this interesting or entertaining, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. Also, if you would like to see the Vice Commodore 128 emulator in action with some instruction on how to use its 80 column screen facilities, check out my recent video on that very topic. Thank you for watching.